good evening everybody um this is going to be a, a little bit a little bit reliant on technology um greg is going to be presenting the slides i'm going to be talking over a slightly um unstable internet but hopefully the sound will come through um the origins of this talk um i first gave this talk earlier this year in the middle east and um the question arose about what is what is the key thing or what are the key um, principles about moving from being a stamp collector to an exhibitor? Um, now, why is this an important question? Well, it's an important question really for two reasons. One is um, that if you take, for example, the 26,000 members of the American Philatelic Society, there probably are only uh, less than 1,000 consistent, regular exhibitors of stamps at various levels of stamp show within the country. So that's 1,000 out of about 26,000. And that's a statistic that pretty much repeats around um, national organizations, national philatelic organizations around the world. So there's a big disconnect between stamp collecting and exhibiting. And the second reason is a more pragmatic one. And this is one which in the US, all the WSP national shows seem to be suffering from with one or two exceptions. West Texas, perhaps one exception and Sarasota. But most of the other WSP shows are suffering from um, a lack of exhibits, a lack of exhibitors. The show chairman are constantly having to contact people and say, are you willing to exhibit? We need exhibits. So there is, again, a significant issue that's facing all of us at this time. So that's, in principle, one of the reasons why this talk came about. So let's um, start to move through the slides, Greg. So if we move on, as we all know, um, move to the next slide, Greg, we all know stamp collecting is really a universal hobby around the world. As I mentioned, the American Society has about 26,000 members. Again, if we move forward, it's a hobby which is not only active in the Middle East, but in Europe, in Asia, and across generations. It spans all generations. If we move to the next slide, Greg, you know, it moves from the younger generation to the older generation. And perhaps this older generation is the one that we most often think about, about stamp collectors. And... Um, there are certainly certain generalizations that you can make about stamp collectors. So now, Greg, moving to the next slide, the important question, and this goes back to what I said at the beginning, not every stamp collector wants to be an exhibitor. For many, their hobby simply involves enjoying their collection out of the public eye, and it's for their own personal enjoyment. Moving on again, Greg, the transition to actually sharing your collection is for most people a very, very big step. Now, you can share your collection in multiple ways. It doesn't necessarily have to be an exhibit. You can share it with family and friends and with fellow collectors in your own home. And for that, you can just arrange your collection however you wish to do it. Again, moving on, Greg. So sharing with your friends, you can all sit around and discuss your stamps and enjoy it and have a good time. Moving forward again, Greg, um, you can share it with your children. You can share it with youth groups. You can share it with other groups. And again, in none of these cases are we dealing with an exhibit in the sense that we all understand it. Moving on, Greg, to the next slide. So what is the essential difference between a collection and an exhibit? Well, the collection can be arranged and organized however you want whatever style whatever arrangement you wish to use you can put things in stock books you can put them on pages you can put them in shoe boxes you can arrange your collection in whatever manner and style you wish moving on greg once we transition moving on greg once we transition to the concept of a stamp exhibit the material has to be organized in line with the criteria of a particular exhibition. Obviously, for a competitive exhibition, it has to be organized to meet the expectations of the judges. That applies when the exhibition is competitive. Again, moving on, Greg. 
Now, we all colloquially talk about a STEM exhibition. Ideally, or in a perfect world, the term exhibition is a little bit misleading because, of course, most exhibitions are competitive, and except for a few invitational exhibits. And in reality, there are very, very few purely exhibit, exhibition-based shows, that is to say, non-competitive shows. The vast majority are really stamp competitions, much like a sporting event would be. Now, moving on again, Greg, please. The reasons to exhibit publicly. Why would you want to exhibit your stamps? Well, it gives an others an opportunity to see the material that you've collected. You share your knowledge about your collecting subject. But there are also benefits that accrue to you. You gain more knowledge about your collecting subject. And for some, the competitive element to be the best is the key driving force. Some people are competitive by nature. Others are not necessarily so. And moving on. Why would you display or compete? That is an obvious question. Well, you can share your hobby in a non-competitive forum at your local stamp club, a specialized study group, or elsewhere by invitation. In most cases, the stamp exhibitions that we talk about, for example, WSP shows, Milk Apex 2024, they are competitive events, a competition with judges. The exhibits are judged and graded against a series of objective criteria. And again, moving on, Greg. Now, in recent years, there are a whole new medium of exhibiting. That is to say, virtual shows has come to the fore. Um, in virtual exhibiting, the exhibit pages can be composed digitally using scans, uh, entries are submitted electronically. And in many ways, it's a very, very easy way to approach exhibiting. For a, a in-person exhibition, such as Milka Pegs, there are obviously the certain practical issues. You have to have all the items mounted on pages, each page within a protective sleeve. And in general, you either have to hand carry or ship your exhibit to the show. Moving on, Greg. Now, virtual exhibiting, we think, is a completely new paradigm. Well, it's still in its infancy, but in fact, the earliest virtual exhibitions were held in New York in the early 2000s. These were organized by the American Stamp Dealers Association, and at that time, they were called Digital Philatelic Studies. They were presented on laptops on the show floor. People could sit down, peruse the exhibits on the laptops, and enjoy them at their own leisure. The exhibits were also judged. Now, moving forward, um, what were these digital philatelic studies, these, these pioneer um, virtual exhibits? Well, they were not a scan of a regular stamp exhibit. The digital philatelic studies was more like a, a research paper presented as an exhibit. They were not restricted to a limited physical space. They focused on three important main dimensions, which were the basis for the judging. The first was computer considerations, analogous probably to the issues of presentation in a more traditional exhibit. There were also considerations of research as well as the philatelic exhibit content of the digital philatelic study. So this is kind of where virtual exhibiting actually really started. Many, many years before COVID and perhaps the time that most people think of DP, digital exhibiting having started. Now, moving on, COVID was indeed a major change in our hobby in very many ways. Obviously, a number of the in-person events um, shut down, and there was a transition towards doing things virtually. Now, how have those virtual shows in the era of COVID come about? Well, in most cases, they simply comprise scans of a regular stamp exhibit viewable online. There's been no attempt to use the full potential of a digital file and multimedia, and candidly, Many senior judges are very, very resistant to the idea of virtual shows. I don't share that point of view, but it is a point of view 
by many serious ju uh, senior judges. Now, what is the main objection by many of those judges to this question of virtual exhibiting? Well, the question comes fundamentally down to, well, does the person actually own the material that they're showing? Because obviously, if all you're doing is looking at virtual images, you don't have that in-person check on are these the items, are they genuine, and so on. So this is really the, the, the major stumbling block that presently impedes a lot of the development of virtual shows. This question of, do you verify and how do you verify ownership? Now, virtual exhibiting, moving on, Greg, virtual ownership has actually now spread very much around the world. Uh, the shows themselves are generally easy and very inexpensive to host. Um, interestingly, both Bangladesh and India have very much been in the forefront of these virtual exhibitions. There was a show in Bangladesh, Bangladesh, 2021, which was the first FIAP, the uh, Is that a We lost you. So in India is, is one show. Uh, South Pen Greg? Colin? Greg? Yeah, you're breaking up quite a bit, Colin. Yeah, we broke, we lost you after Banga Band Who. Oh, I think we dropped them all together. Well, Greg, it's all yours. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I knew. Um, He rejoins here just one second. Greg? Yeah, Colin. We can hear you. Greg? Yeah, can you hear us? Greg? Yep, we can hear you. Hello? You can hear me. Okay. Yes, um, we Greg, can. if we can move to the next slide. Yep. Yeah, Colin, we lost you after Banga Bandu. Uh, after Banga Bandu. Okay, so that's back. Um, okay, all right. So, um, yeah, Banga Bandu 2021 was the first FIAP recognized in the international exhibition. FIAP is the Asian equivalent to the Federation of Intercontinent Inter Inter American Philately, uh, the FIA FIAF, um, which also organized a virtual show and which is shown on the, the slide here. Uh, Greg, if we move on to the next slide. Greg? Yep. You lost me again. No, we can hear you. We're on the Asia takes the lead, others follow slide. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Greg. We can hear you. Greg? Yes. Okay. All right. So apologies, apologies for the technological problems, but um, carrying on. So we were talking about Bangladesh and Asia.
We lost right. you again. Can you hear me? We can hear you now, yes. Okay, Greg, you can hear me? Okay. Mm -hmm. So very much Asia took a lead in terms of the virtual exhibiting. We had Phila Virtue in India and other ex ex other exhibitions that have taken place around the world, mm -hmm. South Pax in South Africa, and the 2024 exhibition South Pax is actually just starting in the next month or so. We have Exponet, which is non-competitive, and all We lost you again. Greg? Yes. Hello? We can hear you. Yeah. The meeting completely. Yeah, the, the internet keeps... Yeah, I don't know if the, where the problem is coming. Um, I'm still showing connected to the internet. Um, let me keep trying. So uh, we mentioned Bang Blandu as the first FIAP recognized exhibition. We also more recently had the uh, joint Abraham Accords for and The virtual exhibit thing is still very much experimental. There's a long, long way for us to move forward with this idea of virtual exhibits. How now to okay. Greg, if we move to the next slide, I don't know where you cut out there. Uh, yeah, we did hear the, however, still experimental, not yet mainstream. Okay, so all right. Um, so moving forward, now let's turn to this question of you as a collector now want to move forward to become an exhibitor. Where's the best place to start? Well, my advice is that the best place to start is to attend as many exhibitions as possible study the exhibits carefully, and get different ideas. Research the opportunities that you have available to you. Address the question in your own mind, do you want to exhibit virtually or in person? You've got to choose your venue, choose your forum. And the best advice, again, I can give is to start local and start small, and then progress to higher level exhibitions. Again, moving forward, Greg. Um, how big an exhibit can you make? Well, depending on the exhibition, exhibits can be made with a very different number of pages. You can essentially start from one page, just like the ATA one-page exhibits, and also the one-page exhibits for Milkapex 2024, and you can move up to a maximum at an APS World Series show of 10 frames, each comprising 16 pages. The practical consideration, and this is the question facing any exhibitor is how much material do you actually have that's really one of the determining factors in how big an exhibit you should make so moving forward greg we can move from the single one page exhibit and the one page exhibit simply tells a complete story or highlights a single or small number of items that can be presented on a single page generally speaking these one-page exhibits are confined to smaller local or regional shows. The ATA um, one-frame exhibits are, of course, an exception to this because that's based on the full membership of the ATA. But for many people, a one-page exhibit is a very, very good place to start. It's not a huge um, amount of work. It's something that can be done fairly quickly and fairly easily. Now, moving forward, um, 
there are, as I've said, many opportunities, competitive and non-competitive, to show a one-page exhibit. In fairness, many of these shows are virtual, and there are two links there, one to the ATA, and of course the Milkopex or our website, milkopex.org, hosts the Milkopex 2024 one-page exhibition. Now, moving forward, Greg, the next step up is really from one page to a single frame exhibit of 16 pages. Now, originally, this concept of a one-frame exhibit was designed to encourage new collectors. However, the concept has somewhat changed more in, in as the um, concept has developed. And increasingly now, it is intended to tell a story which can only be told in 16 pages. So this would be a relatively small, relatively narrow philatelic subject, which can be completely displayed from beginning to end within the 16 pages. Now, moving forward, Greg, why... Um, what are the facilities or what are the potential for one frame exhibits? Well, they are available at APS World Series shows and they also are available internationally. You had CAPEX 2022, which was a one frame international exhibition held in person, and SAVPEX, which I mentioned previously, which is hosted from South Africa by the Philatelic Federation there, is an annual virtual one fr frame exhibition which was first held as many years ago as 2015. I apologize, that's actually an, um, some sort of wild animal um, screaming in the background, so I apologize for the background noises. Now, moving to larger exhibits, the pragmatic aspect to them is that they are more work requiring a lot more material. They are still work with the traditional idea from the single frame of frames comprising 16 pages. In more recent times, there has been an expansion to two, three, and four frame exhibits. This is a new basis for exhibiting both nationally and internationally. Again, very experimental. The traditional approach was always five or eight frames, but in the US, you can exhibit up to 10 frames if you have sufficient material. Moving forward. Now, in-person exhibitions, let's focus a little bit more on those. Those exist at different levels depending where you live, and depending where you live, there are different opportunities to exhibit. Another good place for people to start are these local exhibitions and club-level shows. Whiskapex is a good basis for exhibitors in Wisconsin to put a toe in the water and to start the idea of preparing and submitting an exhibition. Most countries have, moving forward, Glenn, uh, Greg, most countries host national exhibitions. Milkopex is one of the US World Series shows. Other countries, for example, South Africa has an annual show. And just shown there is the catalog for that show back in 2001, one of the South African national shows. Now, moving forward, Greg, the next level are the, um, the international regional exhibitions. Um, Philately Worldwide comes under the Fédération Internationale de Philately, the FIP. Then at the next level down, you have FIAP, the Asian Federation, FEPA, the European Federation, and FIAF, the Inter-American Federation. And each of those federations does host exhibitions on a regional basis. Moving forward, Greg, you have these continental federations that I mentioned, FIAP, FEPA, and FIAF. And those exhibitions take place on a very regular basis. Now, all of these exhibitions are more competitive. Moving forward, Greg, they do have generally strict restrictions or requirements for entry. You normally have to succeed from a certain medal level nationally in order to move forward to those various international level exhibitions. And Generally speaking, start low, start local, and then gradually transition to the higher level exhibitions. It's best done as a step process. Now, again, moving forward, all exhibitions are governed by rules. Rules, rules, rules. The most important thing as a potential exhibitor is to read and understand all of the rules that apply to the shows. 
For most exhibitions, the rules and regulations are available on the show website. The other th aspect is if you have questions, ask. Do not make assumptions about the arrangements and the um, regulations for the shows. Um, for most exhibitions, and this is where things get a little more tricky, you have to pick a class for your exhibit. So the question is, what is a class? Well, moving quickly over the next few slides, Greg, there are different types of exhibit. There's traditional class, which involves the production and use of the stamps themselves. Moving forward, the postal history class, which involves rates, routes, and markings, aspects of the historical development of the postal services set within a geographic or historical rate period. Moving forward, we have thematic and topical exhibiting. Is there a difference? Yes, there is. But I would say that thematic and topical exhibiting is one of the hardest categories to deal with because you have to not only have knowledge about the philatelic aspects, but you also have to have a deep knowledge of the subject that you're showing. Again, moving forward, thematics. Um, those of you from the ATA group know far more about thematics than I do. So let's move forward, Greg. And topical exhibiting. Similarly, the ATA is a great source of information if you want to exhibit topically. And they have a lot of basic guides, both to the concept of collecting and also to the transition of exhibiting. So the ATA, for those of you who wish to exhibit thematically or topically, is a tremendous source of information. Moving forward, Greg, we have uh, the revenues or fiscal class. Now, those have developed as a separate class in relatively recent years. Are they fundamentally different from traditional and postal history? Not really. They are simply fiscal history, showing documents and analysis of fees and charges, or a study of fiscal stamps, how they're produced and how they're used. So essentially, they parallel the two divisions between traditional and postal history. Moving forward, Greg, the other categories which are available to a potential exhibitor are the social and display class or aerophilately. And again, moving forward, Greg, there's also postal stationery, first aid covers, maxima, fully, and astrophilately. And again, a lot of details about each of these show classes are given on the uh, American Philatelic Society website under the judging information, where you'll find a copy of the judging manual. Now you say, why would I want to look at the judging manual? Well, it also contains a lot of information about exhibiting and you'll find the details of the classes there. Now, the one advantage in the US is that for national shows, the WSP shows, there are essentially no classes anymore. The classes have largely been eliminated. And so you don't have this difficulty of saying, well, what is my exhibit? Is it really a traditional exhibit or is it really a revenue exhibit or so on? But as you move forward to either the regional shows, the FIAP, FEPA or FIAF shows, you have the question of picking the class for your exhibit. So initially, it's not an issue, but as you move forward, it is going to become a question that you have to address. Now, moving forward, Greg, again, another new area for study is picture postcards. Milka Pex 2023 was focused around the theme of picture postcards, and there were some very, very strong postcard exhibits. And this is another growing area within our hobby. Initially, there was some resistance to the idea of embracing exhibits of picture postcards. But now I think there's a, a very strong and very healthy following for exhibiting picture postcards. Now, moving forward, Greg, how do you choose your topic? What aspects of your collection should you show? Well, pick an area of your collection that actually interests you more than others. Pick an area where you have sufficient interesting or scarcer material. And at the end of the day, the real question is, having enough material to do an exhibit of the size and scope you've chosen. At the end of the day, material is key to your exhibit. So moving forward, Greg, the other aspect that is key to it is knowledge. Uh, exhibiting is a learning curve. Um, one of the key benefits to exhibiting is to increase your knowledge about the subject that you're exhibiting. So literature is very important. Moving forward, Greg, research and sources of information. 
in your presenting your exhibit, one of the key components that judge is looking for is your knowledge of the subject that you're showing. So you need to expose yourself to literature, you need to read, you need to study, you need to potentially acquire the books that are going to be most helpful for the topic that you're showing. Moving forward, Greg. Now, let's think about composing an exhibit. Generally, you will only exhibit part of your collection. There will be your collection and then drawn from your collection will be your exhibit. So you need a clear idea of the subject and how best to develop the concept according to the exhibit class that you've chosen. You need a title page and that needs a clear statement of purpose and scope, preferably in the first sentence. And the exhibit itself should comprise all the relevant material with supporting content and text. For a postcard exhibit, the most important thing to remember is you're showing the postcard side. So again, moving forward, judging. Now I mentioned that judging is um, a, an essential component to most of our stamp exhibitions. I mentioned there are very, very few which are purely uh, non-competitive. So most exhibitions use a variation of the same form of judging, the same judging form, and the different point categories. And again, you'll find a copy of the judging sheet on the APS website, and that's available to everybody. You just go to the website, go to the, the pull-down menu, and you can pull up a copy of the judging form. This, again, will give you a good insight to some of the categories and some of the things that you need to develop in your exhibit. You take the different judging criteria, treatment, Moving forward, Greg, importance, knowledge, research, and study. And all of those categories are reflected on that form. And you can see how the points are allocated within those different categories. And that's something that's best you study at home, at your leisure. And again, if you have questions about those different categories, treatment, importance, and so on, talk to a judge. Talk to somebody who's been a successful exhibitor. Most times they're willing and able to help you and to explain what all the different terms mean and how those different categories are assessed. Now, again, a really important thing to remember is that an exhibit is not a book. It's very easy to end up, end up writing huge amounts of information on your exhibit pages. The key thing to remember is the material is what is most important. The material should be prominent, should be clearly visible. Brevity and write-up. Brevity, brevity, brevity. It's really, really important in terms of being a successful exhibitor. Information must be accurate, focused, and relevant. That's another way of saying brief and correct. Where you make conclusions or where you make interpretations are those conclusions and interpretations correct? The judges are going to be looking at things very, very carefully. So you should be in a position to, at least in your own mind, satisfy yourself that the opinions and the conclusions that you've given are correct. Moving forward, Greg, <clears throat> some of the other categories that people are going to be considering, the judges are going to be looking at rarity. Obviously, rarity is not necessarily just a reflection of price and value. Not every rarity needs to be included. If you're missing a few items, a few scarce items, well, that is not a reason not to exhibit. Um, you have to quantify the rarity of the items that you're showing. Again, it's a question of showing your knowledge through the rarity and scarcity of the material that you're showing. Moving forward, Greg. Condition. Now, obviously, condition is in the eye of the beholder. Certain early classic issues, the condition is not going to be as fine as more recent items. So the condition will reflect the age, the rarity, and the type of the item. Uh, modern items obviously have to be in fine condition. Repaired and restored items should be noted. Again, moving forward, Greg. Now, presentation. If you look back at the judging form, this only receives five points. So perhaps you think it's unimportant, 
but actually it's one of the most important categories of all in the judging forum. The presentation underlines the, underlies the overall visual exhibit of the exhibit. Legibility, opinions and recommendations change. Um, many years ago, virtually every exhibit was handwritten. You would occasionally see typewritten exhibits where pages were prepared on a manual typewriter, then a transition to electronic typewriter. Today, virtually every exhibit is prepared on a computer. So again, you have to um, have a, a level of computer dexterity in terms of presentation. But th this category does also underlie all of the other judging criteria. It's a question of how the exhibit will, will visually appeal to the judges, or if you're in a non-competitive forum, to the general public looking at the exhibit. So moving forward, Greg, innovation, creativity, and individuality. Now, today, because of the use of computers, many exhibits have a sameness, a same visual appeal. Frequently, postal history exhibits often look the same, irrespective of the subject. Um, now, innovation and creativity will get the judge's attention, but you have to be careful. Sometimes you can take too much advantage of the technology. You can create pages which are just too complicated, multicolor, um, all sorts of different typefaces and type fonts. Innovation, creativity should be done carefully. They should be carefully crafted and should generally be done in moderation. But it's not to say that they are not a, not a good idea. Now, judges themselves also make certain assumptions. Um, they will, generally speaking, suggests that the primary focus of every exhibitor is to win and that they want to be told how to get a higher award. It's not necessarily the case. Some exhibitors simply exhibit for their own personal pleasure. Judges, good judges, do not assume that they know every subject and that their knowledge exceeds that of the exhibitor. A good judge has respect for the knowledge of the exhibitor. Now, some judges will assume that there's a universal method to organize and present any subject. But again, a good judge will be willing and, and broad-minded enough to assess any new method or any new ideas in presenting an exhibit. But in terms of judging, the key thing is a judge will prepare ahead of time. They will look into previous exhibits of the subject, They'll research some of the literature. And generally, they will have done a lot of homework on your subject. And that, again, feeds back to the point of making sure that the information on your pages is accurate and correct. Now, moving forward, uh, Greg, the title page, the title, and the plan. These are, again, all very, very important aspects of preparing an exhibit. They're, in fact, probably the page the, the title page will be one of the pages that you will spend most time preparing. Do a draft. Um, you will go through multiple, ver multiple versions of your title page. Similarly, you will go through multiple versions of your synopsis page. Um, each and every stage of the way, you will be making changes. And before you submit your final title pages and synopsis, you need to look back and very carefully assess whether they correspond accurately with the exhibit that you finally prepared. Moving forward, Greg, the synopsis. Now, what is the synopsis? Well, it is basically your opportunity to promote your exhibit to the judges. Uh, it's the, the, the one page where you can really blow your own trumpet and, and, and in a sense, sell your exhibit to the judges. Now, obviously, they will be basing their assessment on the material shown in the frames, if it's an in-person show, or virtually, uh, if it's a virtual show. But in the synopsis, you can give the judges a lot more information about the overall scope and content of the exhibit than you might do on individual pages. So your synopsis is a very, very key component to preparing an exhibit. Moving forward, Greg. 
Now, points and medals. This chart just, um, we don't need to go through in any detail, but this just summarizes how the different medals correspond with the APS point range. Now, one of the interesting aspects of recent years judging is that more and more exhibits are getting uh, large gold, gold, and large Vermeer medals. However, you should not be uh, should not feel disappointed if you get a silver, a silver, bronze, or a bronze medal. Um, they are still um, key uh, successes in the exhibiting forum. And many subjects, it's hard to get a large gold. Um, so that should not be a disincentive to you in terms of preparing an exhibit. So moving forward, Greg, a few last minute thoughts on exhibiting. Um, don't be disappointed. Don't be discouraged. If the first time out you get a silver bronze medal or a silver medal, do not be discouraged. No exhibit is perfect the first time out. Exhibits can always be improved upon. And not all judges or individual juries will agree as to the appropriate award. You may, in fact, find that one show you receive a large for May, another show you receive a large silver there will be a degree of variation in show results. Not too many, one hopes, but there may from time to time be significant variations. Now, what are the limiting factors to an exhibit? Well, the potential of an exhibit is mostly limited by the depth, scope, and challenge of the subject and the range and completeness of the material that you have. As you add material to your collection, so you will fill out and expand upon your collection. But the key thing is, don't be disappointed or discouraged by the results that you get, either at one show or at a series of shows. Now, in conclusion, here are just a couple of um, websites um, that I think are helpful in terms of becoming an exhibitor. The AAPE, the American Association of Philatelic Exhibitors website, has a lot of information available. The APS Judging Manual, which is available on the APS website, stamps.org, is incredibly helpful. Again, although, although crafted from the perspective of judging, it does help the exhibitor understand the thought process of the, ju of the judging. And it also explains a lot of the thought behind the different judging categories for the exhibits. Uh, Exponet, um, that's one virtual uh, exhibition where you can look at different exhibits and get ideas. Another useful thing which I found very helpful is the Postal Museum has a website where they show a glossary of philatelic terms. This is a very, very useful um, source for using the correct terminology for material that you show in your exhibit. So that, again, is, is, is a useful source of information. But summarizing, the most important thing is if you're going to move to become an exhibitor, ask. Ask the show organizers. Ask other exhibitors. Ask judges their advice. Um, show them copies of, of drafts for your exhibit pages. Um, solicit information. The uh, AAPE has a critique service where if you have a draft of your uh, exhibit, you can submit it to the critique service to have it reviewed by judges. Um, all of that information and all of those sources are available to you as a potential exhibitor. But again, reiterating something that I said earlier, start local and start small. If you're in Wisconsin, think about Wiscopex. Think about your local stamp club. That's where to start. Don't necessarily jump in at the deep end with a full WSP show. Start with a, a limited exhibit in terms of the number of pages, the scope. And it may be that you find exhibiting at the local level is as far as you want to go. There's no necessary reason to progress to those higher levels of exhibiting. But the choices remain with you. So I would slightly overrun. Um, I'd aim for about 30 minutes. I apologize very much for the technological um, impediments in the middle. Um, I don't know if there are any specific questions or um, that people have, but um, through um, the people at Milkopex, you can certainly get in touch if anybody has any questions or things that they would like to discuss. Um, 
I'm very happy for the Milkopex committee to share my email or my cell phone number with any anybody who has any questions about potentially becoming an exhibitor. So thank you very much. Um, we're certainly well within the hour, but as I say, I, I did overrun a little bit from the half hour that I'd intended. Kyle, so looks like there Greg, may be some questions here. I don't know. Uh, okay. Stephen, did you have a question? No, okay. No, thank you very much. It was very informative to walk through those steps because certainly within the Cedar Rapids Stamp Club uh, and Iowa, I have other individuals asking me to prepare exhibits. And so your your outline on how to start small uh, with our Serapex show annually uh, would be a good starting point for me. Thank you very much for your comments. Okay. Okay. Yes, this was very informative. Thank you so much, Colin. You're welcome.